Lovely. Right. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining. Um, seems a bit strange to be talking about spring tips when we've had the weather that we've had today. Um, but I promise you that spring is on the way and we do need to consider it. Um, and yeah, it's particularly for our good doers, obviously knowing you know, how um, well they can do in the spring and summer months. So that's what we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, my name's Gina and um, I'm a um, representative for the central region. And um, so I will do way clinics and I'm also on the care line as well. And I do look after retailers in the region as well. Um, if you have any questions throughout, um, you can pop them in the chat and my colleague Bella um, is extremely helpful and very good at answering your questions as you would go along um, if you've got any <laughs> burning questions. Um, otherwise, best. <laughs> oh, she's fantastic. She's underselling herself. Um, I think you should all test her. Um, <laughs> but no, if you'd like to wait until the end, equally, that's absolutely fine. We will have some time at the end for some questions. Um, we'll always try and keep it to sort of um, four to five minutes for the presentation itself and have um, time at the end for questions as well. OK. So um, there is the chance for you to take part um, in our sort of Eagle. Slido um, questionnaire. Well, not questionnaire. I don't want to be um, on. I don't want to be on. Getting a bit of feedback there. Um, if you want to get involved, so you just need to join at slido.com and you'll see there, you'll just need to pop in this code and hopefully, hopefully that will allow you to access. Um, if you're having problems, do just shout at the time. I am going to have to go off um, the presentation for some reason. It never links up with mine and I had to get a code and all sorts anyway. So it's easier for me just to jump out the presentation, hopefully see the poll and then jump back in when we're done. So for those of you that have joined us before, you may or may not be aware um, already that the science behind spillers is provided by the Equine Studies Group at Waltham, um, Pet Care Science Institute, um, which is a leading scientific scientific authority on pet nutrition and care, as well as being home to the Waltham Equine Studies Group. So this group is headed up by um, Dr. Pat Harris, our science director, um, and she has collaborated with key research institutes um, and in universities around the world for many, many years. Um, and the work remains at the forefront of nutritional equine science. So some of the areas that we do specifically look at um, include obesity, laminitis, senior horses and ponies as well. Um, and essentially what we're trying to do um, is create a better world for horses through partnering with you and you know, helping you to care for your horses in the best possible way. So you can find more out about Waltham and um, you know, the, the Equine Studies Group on our website if that's something that interests you. There's lots and lots of blogs on there and information around the research that's been done. So please do have a look. I'm Gina, I've lost your presentation slides. Oh. I can see you, just not your presentation. Oh, <laughs> definitely do not want to see me. <laughs> do that again. There we go. Are we back? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> OK, so um, so highlights in obesity research specifically then. Obviously, you know, with our good doers, unfortunately, they might be at risk of becoming obese at some point in their lifetime. Hopefully not. Um, but yeah, we um, lots and lots of research. So first of all, developing a number of low um, now commonly recommended um, methods for monitoring conditions such as the crusty neck score and belly girth and rump width measurements. Um, we've also done research that's um, producing the evidence to support the recommendation that horses and ponies with a body condition score of seven seven um, out of nine should be considered as obese and this has now become the globally accepted definition. Um, we had the very first study to evaluate the strip, um, effect of strict grazing on body weight, um, also a series of studies evaluating the effect of grazing muzzles on pasture intake and body weight, um, uh, and research papers showing that some horses and ponies may actually be weight loss resistant. So they're working against us, unfortunately, um, showing that the severity of calorie restriction may affect the rate of future weight gain. So if we are going to get our horses and ponies to lose weight, making sure um, you know, we're, we're doing it in a safe way. Um, and finally, showing that in some weight loss resistance ponies, gut microflora involved in the fibre digestion may actually be able to adapt to counteract a restricted diet. So these hidden tools that they've got to, to use against us.
This is good. Can you just see a white screen? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this has not happened before. Just um, come out of presenter mode and go back in. I wonder if it was just not letting me do anything. Oh, just having a moment. Yeah, let me try that. Let me let me, let me stop presenting like you said. Mm. Oh, it's very really annoying. Um, let me try and get past the, um, I wonder if it's the Slido that's messing it up. There we go. I think it's the Slido slide. So whenever I get to one of those, it, I may not be doing Slido this evening. It <laughs> very much doesn't like Slido. Um, so um, you can, if we can try a slightly different way. Um, and I won't do this one now because I've just given you the answers. I was going to ask people how we monitor our horse's weight and condition. Um, so essentially, these are the kind of things that I was looking for you to drop in. Um, but first of all, body condition scoring. Um, so essentially, well, we use a scale of one to nine and we're assessing um, five points of the horse. You can see on this diagram here. So neck, withers, just behind the shoulder, across the ribs, up in the loins and the tail head. Um, and you know, these are several areas where fat is commonly laid down um, and then they are scored using a numerical grading system. As I said, most commonly the one to nine or a one, zero to five scale. Um, but we use the more widely validated one to nine. Um, whichever system you're using, the most important thing is to apply it consistently. We also have body condition in index, um, which is a more objective method of assessing body fat. Um, so similar to BMI in humans, um, essentially uses a mathematical equation to calculate a score between one and nine using four body measurements. Um, a weigh tape, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. They won't give you an accurate weight necessarily, um, but they will just help you assess whether your horse is going up or down. And they can obviously be a really useful tool for you guys at home um, and obviously weigh bridges. So if you've got access to a weigh bridge somehow, that's great on the yard. Otherwise, obviously, lots of companies, feed companies and in independent weigh bridge and vets and you do offer you know, a weigh bridge service. So um, they will obviously give us an accurate weight on the weigh bridge. However, um, we don't actually know if that weight is correct for that horse unless we use one of the other methods so you know often when I'm on a yard um, actually the body condition scoring process is more useful to me um, in terms of offering nutritional advice than it is you know actually their weight on the weigh bridge so you can find more information how to mon you know how to monitor their body condition score on our um website as well um essentially you know we're looking for sort of a four and a half to a five and a half out of nine is the kind of sweet spot um especially for our you know our good doers coming out of winter going into spring and summer we would maybe like them to be a little bit lighter um just to give them i you know always say that sort of um buffering uh <laughs> to allow them to you know put it on not that we want them to gain too much if we can help it but ultimately we know they are going to gain some weight in those spring and summer months 
So with the way tapes, you know, ideally you're using them weekly. Um, and if you're lucky enough to have the way bridge again, you know, you can use that as often as, as weekly as well. Um, and also, you know, using the tape measure to measure other key areas such as belly girth and rump width. So practical tips then moving forward in terms of how we're going to manage our good doers going into spring. Um, so essentially, we want to know what our horse is eating. Um, you know, as in their actual hard feed, but also their forage as well. Um, we want to potentially restrict their access to grass. So that might mean strip grazing, a grazing muzzle or turnout pens. Um, consider soaking their hay. Um, not something people often think about, but actually sometimes we can use straw as an um, alternative to just hay or haylage. Um, maintaining exercise, if possible, appreciate a day like today, that is going to be somewhat of a challenge. Um, and trying not to over rug as well. And of course, trying to provide them a balanced diet as much as possible. So, you know, this is what we're going to be talking about in more detail. And, you know, these are the main steps in terms of, you know, trying to get our, our horses in, in a healthy position. So just remember, um, forage is the largest source of calories. So actually only today I had a conversation with a lady on the phone and she was um, very much tunnel vision and she needed her horse to lose weight. And all she wanted to talk about was what was actually going in the bucket. And she hadn't even considered the fact um, that obviously the largest proportion of calories for her horse was actually its hay, its grass, haylage, whatever she was using. So it is surprising how we tend to forget sometimes that, yeah, that is, it's not celery. Um, it is going to, um, I suppose, if you ate enough celery that would contribute to us as well but um it's it is going to contribute hugely so how much grass do our horses eat so looking specifically at grass as our forage source to begin with you know most of you um, i'm sure have horses with access to grass um for some time if not all of the time um if they're out 24 7 um, it is impossible for us to know exactly how much our horses eat because they're all different and they're all going to vary in terms of how much they want to eat and how much they can eat. So, um, you know, depending on what is available to them. So it has been seen, however, for ponies to eat um, as much as 5% of their body weight if leaving out uh, living out 24-7. Um, so that's 12.5 kilo um, for a 250 kilo um, pony, which um, is actually enough to fuel a 500 kilo racehorse. Um, so an awful lot. Um, so it is surprising as well what they can find um, out there, even when it looks really bare. And, you know, today is a perfect example, actually, of yeah, yes, there was snow on the ground, certainly around here. Um, obviously, if it's thick, thick, so they, they can't get through to it. But if there's a smattering of snow, and even though the grass looks really short, it is surprising. Those good doers, they will go out there and they will be determined to find it. So um, don't underestimate them. Oh, here we go. So enough energy or calories to fuel a 500 kilo racehorse. And how much sugar is in our grass? So again, actually the largest contributor of sugar in our horses and ponies diet is their forage um, and a large proportion coming from their grass. So grass can be up to 15% um, simple sugars, mainly sucrose, and, and up to 35% water soluble carbohydrates. So simple sugars plus fructan. Um, so up to two kilos of simple sugars from grass alone for a 250 kilo pony living out 24 seven. So if you think your standard um bag of sugar is a kilo and actually I got told off in the dentist the other day for having five cups of tea with a teaspoon of sugar in each time and I got told that was a lot of sugar um so I mean if I was eating a kilo of sugar um a day I'd be really very worried um so yeah two kilos is is an excessive amount so how can we try and you know manage this grass intake restrict that amount of sugar going in but you know just general calories as well um so first of all one of the you know, strip grazing one of the more common methods that i'm sure lots of people will have used or tried um you know research has showed that strip grazed ponies gain significantly less weight compared to ponies given free access um, to a restricted amount of grazing over a 28 day period, regardless of whether a back fence was used. 
Um, and in fact, strip grazing without a bat fence was no less effective than strip grazing with a bat fence, even though the grazing area got larger every day. Um, however, um, as always, um, this may depend on how big the field is to begin with. It depends on how many horses are grazing out there. Um, also depends on you know, your horse's body condition and the, you know, the rate of grass growth as well. So we do have to do everything on an individual basis. But the science says that strip grazing is an effective way of managing their intake. Um, and, you know, also track systems as well. Obviously, lots of people now moving to track systems where they can. Um, I appreciate it's not some of the methods we're going to talk about um, this evening. And, you know, you are governed by where you are liveried, you know, where you keep your horse. And it's just trying to find something that works for you. And, you know, if you, you know, hopefully there'll be something you can take away that you can use. I'm going to have to delete these slides, I think. Sorry, everybody. I'm just going to quickly delete these slides and then hopefully we won't have any more interruptions. Although I'm not sure why that did that at that time. OK, hopefully this will work now. OK, can you see that? Yeah, we can. Good. I think I've just uninstalled it, so hopefully it will stop messing around. Um, OK, so um, considering non-grass turnout, so um, it seems cruel, perhaps, but I always think, um, you know, if it means the pony can get out and it's not looking at four walls, thinking how hungry it is, um, and if we can manage it with, you know, hay, um, you know, soaked hay, whatever we need to do, um, and, you know, also slowing them down with, you know, hay nets and grass balls and just various things to try and keep them amused. But at least they're out in the fresh air and not stuck in a stable. So, um, yeah, non-grass turnout in terms of turnout pens with wood chip or, you know, whatever you've got available to you. Grazing muzzles. Um, so, you know, lots of um, advice around grazing muzzles. But, and you know, again, not many people... Um, well, not, lots of people don't necessarily like the look of them. Um, doesn't mean that they don't use them. Um, but they, again, for me, I kind of think at least it means the pony is out potentially with his friends um, and he can have a relatively normal horse life. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the research has shown them to reduce grass intake by an average of 
up to 80 percent and that's regardless of the season so they can be used all year round it's all to do with grass length and um, so it's if, you know if the grass is not too long and not too short and they can get enough through, mu through the muzzle there's no reason why they can't have one on um however obviously don't leave them on 24 7 from a welfare point of view you know either you know have them in for a small amount of time to give them a break um or you know again non-grass turnout pen something like that if we can so lots of information as well you will find in terms of muzzles and how to introduce them um, and use them safely. Um, so one key thing, and again, I've, I see it often of people just um, bonking on a muzzle and sending their pony out into the field and expecting it to be happy about it. Um, if you can introduce it gradually, I know it might seem like a big ask, but, you know, 30 minutes and an hour, an hour and a half, you know, building it up just so that they try and accept it um, a little bit more. Um, obviously checking them, you know, they're able to eat and they're able to drink, making sure the grass isn't too long or too short and it can actually be accessed through the base of the muzzle, um, monitoring their weight and body condition regularly um, and regular dental checkups and so making sure there's no excessive wearing down of their teeth. Um, looking for signs of rubbing, making sure the muzzle fits correctly. Although I, what I will say is actually trying to get them to keep them on, of, of course, um, is a challenge. And I've seen all sorts of um, contraptions you know, tied into mains and sewn in different places. Um, but yeah, please do try and make sure they are still comfortable. Um, monitor behaviour um, for signs of distress, a bit, you know, particularly when they're out in the herd, making sure they're not, in get, you know, not getting bullied as well. Um, so beware of binge eating. So uh, again, I will get the pushback from people sometimes. That, oh, they only go out for an hour or two a day. Believe me, um, your horse will learn that you're only going to turn it out for an hour or two. And it has got jamming as much grass as possible in that small amount of time. Um, so ponies have been seen again um, to consume up to 1% of their body weight in dry matter in just three hours if turned out without a muzzle or any restriction at all. Um, so, yeah, if you turn them out onto a nice grassy field um, and say, yes, they might be out there for a short time, but they will stuff in as much as they possibly can in that short space of time um, and say, you know, bearing in mind they're meant to eat 1.5% of their body weight dry matter per day, 1% is quite a significant amount in just three hours. I could probably manage it, to be honest. Um, overnight turnout. So again, no exact science behind this, and it's always variable based on what grass is available, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, however, um, we can consider turning out at night um, when water soluble carb carbohydrate levels may be lower. And this is based on the fact that the grass is using the sugar that it produced in the daytime um, to grow itself, so it's less available for the horses to eat. Um, and that's the basis on that. Um, and obviously, you know, you have the conversation around frosty mornings and, and things like that as well and sunny, frosty mornings and how we shouldn't necessarily turn out at those times either. And that's based on the fact there's actually a double whammy of sugar um, because the sunlight is there. So the grass can produce the sugar, but it can't actually grow um, because it's not warm enough in order for it to do so. Um, but if it's four degrees or above, you know, grass will um, essentially hopefully be growing. So moving away from grass then and just considering our other you know, forms of our horse's forage. Um, so first of all, um, consider having your forage sources analysed. Um, so looks can be deceptive. Again, I'll often get told that the horse is having um, mature old hay. It's been sat around for a donkey's years, so I have nothing in it. Unfortunately, it might be mouldy, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it won't still be high in sugar. So it's, you know, licks can be deceptive 100 percent. Consider feeding soaked hay um, or perhaps a hay replacer that we can guarantee the levels of you know, starch and sugar um, and consider feeding perhaps straw as a partial replacement as well. So hay versus haylage. Um, so you know, what, what, you know, what's the best thing from a good doer's point of view? Um, obviously, people, you know, often assume that haylage is higher in sugar and perhaps protein and energy and calories um, 
then hay. Unfortunately, it's it's not always the case, and it may be. Um, but hay also has the potential to be really high in you know sugar and calories. So um, the only way to know is to test your forage. However, unfortunately, again, it's not not always wholly reliable. Just on the basis that every bale will vary. So you might test that one little section from that one bale, um, but it will vary throughout bales, throughout obviously your batch of hay that you've got so it will give you a nice something to work with um but unfortunately we can't 100 guarantee that it's safe especially if you've got a laminitic or something like that um obviously with hay you can soak it however whereas you can't with the hay lidge due to the bacteria build up um but yeah so that is a huge benefit in terms of hay the other option of course is our hay replacer option so finding things that we know have a controlled level of starch and sugar um, and therefore we know exactly what's going in and in, and in what amount. So we can use straw. Lots of people look at me a bit funny when we talk about, about straw, um, but it can replace um, up to 30 to 50 percent of their total forage ration. Um, however, we must introduce it gradually. This does apply to any forage, really, if we're changing forage around. Um, ideally, we want to introduce it slowly. Um, but yeah, it's all to do with um, having to perhaps chew it slightly differently and just their digestive system being set up to um, utilise it in the right way. Um, also, as I said, yeah, considering a low calorie hay replacer with a controlled level of starch and sugar. So, you know, I suppose the challenge with that is just trying not to let them eat it and then it's gone. <laughs> but if you, um, you know, if you put up a serve up a nice bowl of happy hoof in front of them and they're thinking, oh, this is great. Um, I've just got this massive bowl of feed. So, you know, if we are using hay replacers in that way, ideally trying to split them up across multiple feeds. And, you know, sometimes we have to do that with older horses in particular for other reasons anyway. But um, if we're doing it from a good doer point of view, um, yeah, just trying to spread it out and making sure they don't woof it all in one. Now, with the straw, you can use any type of straw as well. Um, it's all about the hygienic quality. So um, ideally, we could steam the straw to make sure there isn't anything nasty there. Um, but yeah, any type of straw should be OK. Oh, um, so soaking hay. So, yeah, it can um, help to reduce the level of water soluble carbohydrates. Um, it definitely can. And, and that's what the science says. However, um, results are variable. Um, and again, we can't guarantee its safety for laminitics, for example. So if you think that we can reduce by up to 40, maybe even 50 percent, um, say we are looking for less than 10 to 12 percent NSC um, and it starts out at 30 percent, even if we reduce by a you know, maximum of half, that's still 15 percent, which is higher than what we are ideally looking for. Um, but it is a really useful tool. It does work. Um, and, you know, UK forage is known to contain very little starch and testing for WSC by wet chemistry is generally sufficient. Um, so we can test and see what is there. So um, if you do want to send away forage for analysis, um, it should be able to give you a pretty good representation of what level of WSC is present. Um, and I did have one of my questions was asking everybody about the amount of time that we should be soaking hay and there's lots of conflict in advice and uh, conversations about all sorts of things out there at the moment but um currently you know six to twelve hours in cold weather um and one to three hours in warm weather um so yeah obviously a little bit of common sense involved in terms of when we had 40 degrees last summer and you know popping your bucket out in you know, blazing sunlight and it practically boiling within 20 minutes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, not ideal. And you, it's all to do with, you know, the, the bacteria build up and things like that we're trying to avoid. So, you know, keep it out of direct sunlight, those kind of things, um, just from a bacterial and hygienic point of view. Soaking versus steaming. So, again, always surprising how often I get questions around steaming and people think that, you know, they're helping in terms of the sugar level. Um, unfortunately, not. So um, steaming is fantastic in terms of improving the hygienic quality and reducing the number of respirable particles. So those that are small enough to inhale and microbial contam um, contamination. Um, but it's not very effective at reducing levels of WSC. So although less 
um, much less practical. Um, in an ideal world, um, if we could soak and then steam, so soaking to reduce the WSC and then steaming to make sure it's not um, doing them any damage in terms of you know bacterial buildup. Um, however, we must avoid homemade steamers. Um, unfortunately, if they're not getting hot enough, um, it's a nice, warm, moist environment for the bacteria to actually multiply rather than killing it. Um, so it's just doing the opposite, actually, of what we're trying to achieve. So unfortunately, yes, they can be expensive, but they are a well worth investment. So how much of this forage should I feed? So whichever it is you've chosen, what route you're going down. Um, the technical answer, 1.5% of current body weight per day on a dry matter basis. Um, so for most horses and ponies, um, that should hopefully apply. Um, so this means essentially seven and a half kilos dry matter for a 500 kilo horse. Um, now, I'm, you've probably noticed I keep talking about dry matter. So what does that actually mean? So all forage, so even hay that looks very, very dry is going to contain some water um, and that doesn't count towards your horse's forage intake. Um, so, for example, if we've weighed out seven and a half kilo um, of hay, that's actually six and a half kilo to seven kilo of actual dry hay, 0.5 to one kilo of that is water um, and, you know, as an estimation. So. When we then soak hay as well, um, again, it's going to contain less hay, more water. Of course it is. Um, and if soaking for more than an hour, increase the amount of hay you soak by approximately 20 percent, unless you're feeding the ad lib. Um, so I know you're probably all thinking, I just need to know what goes in my net. Um, so um, if you have your 500 kilo horse, as an example, so that's a minimum of nine kilos if fed dry. And if we're going to feed um, soaked, that's 11 kilos before soaking. Um, if you get stuck, my advice on yard is always just call somebody, the care line, you know, Spiller's care line, um, and test your uh, <laughs> nutritionist who picks up the phone, give them your horse's weight and um, ask them to work it out for you. That's the easiest option. Um, whenever you do feed them, especially for our good doers, it's finding ways, of course, to slow them down as well. So massively important. What if we are going to restrict their forage intake? No, we don't want to cause other issues. Um, so trying to slow them down as much as possible. So really small hold hay nets, double hay nuts. Um, you know, I, I think we uh, Red Brings did a is it, um, exercise, big bouncy ball thing in a hay net when the ball... Uh, horse pony was rolling it around hay balls hay net swinging from um goodness knows what in the rafters but i'm not telling you to do any one of those things from a safety point of view again it's an individual basis on what the horse is not going to hurt themselves with um but yeah i can tell you colin my cob he would um smash the life out of a hay net hanging from a wall a ceiling um so, yeah, it just um, depends on your horse and but trying to find ways that can work for them. Um, and they're not just it's, you know, when it's just on the floor and it's easy access and they've inhaled it and then they're stood for hours and hours with nothing. It's not ideal. So counting droppings, um, so it can be a more practical practical way of managing forage intake if you don't know how much um, your horse weighs or if he has access to grazing um, and essentially we're aiming to reduce the number of droppings by a third initially if your horse or pony is overweight and I you know never more than half um, so it's just you know if you have got your horse on a diet and you think that it is you know you're hoping that it's working if you start to count droppings and you see that drop of a third then hopefully yes it is doing the job that you want it to do. So just moving on then to sort of hard feed and what's going in our horses' buckets. Um, so first of all, essentially what I'm trying to display here is just remembering to feed by weight and not volume. Um, so just a little um, sort of you know example of how, for example, yeah, high fibre cubes and happy hoof have very similar um amounts of calories per kilo but once we put them in our stub scoop they're extremely different so 16.8 megajoules of digestible energy 
in our um, high fibre cubes in a big round bowl stub scoop in comparison to Happy Hoof, which is just 4.4. And that's simply because Happy Hoof is a lot, lot lighter in that scoop than the cubes. Um, and again, even bigger difference for the Digest Plus conditioning cubes versus the conditioning fibre. Um, so you will get about 500 grams of conditioning fibre in a scoop like that and two kilos in a scoop um, for the conditioning cube, sorry. So yeah, 24 megajoules of digestible energy versus 6.6. .6. So vastly different. So again, I get all sorts of um, tales of what we're measuring out feeding, you know, margarine tubs and goodness knows what, but um, it's really handy to know what your horse is actually eating by weight. Um, and, you know, then, especially if you're phoning someone like myself on the care line and we can establish if they you know actually need what they're having um, and actually if it is, are causing them a huge problems. Sometimes people ring and think, you know, they're having loads of food and they're really worried they need to reduce their, you know, their what's in their bucket. But actually, it's just um, a scoop of chaff. And although it might look like a lot, um, it's not actually a, a huge amount. So, um, again, this is just to demonstrate sort of calories um, between some of our feeds and, and what they're contributing. So you can see here balances um, just 2.5 um, megajoules of digestible energy in 250 grams of balancer. That's in comparison to 400 grams of low calorie chaff, which is 4.5 megajoules of digestible energy. You know, moving up to our low calorie cubes, um, 18, and then conditioning cubes and mix, 24. Um, and, you know, the big jump, you know, 24 hours of that spring grass that we've been talking about for a 250 kilo pony, you know, 138 megajoules of digestible energy approximately. Um, and then a good comparison here as well of average meadow hay consumed at 2% body weight for a 250 kilo pony, which is 40 megajoules of digestible energy. If we were to restrict down to the 1.5%, you can see it drops down to the 30 megajoules of digestible energy. Um, and just remembering um, that your daily energy and calorie requirement for a 250 kilo pony in light work is 42 megajoules of digestible energy. Um, so yeah, it's <laughs> it's quite eye-opening sometimes. And again, you can just see that contribution of you know from their forage is is obviously you know massive. So um, balancers, lots of people still not necessarily sure what a balancer does. Um, essentially, it's a small nutrient dense pellet. Um, so it's you know allowing us to cut the calories, but not the nutrients. So they're still able to get all of their bits and mins and quality proteins in the correct amount, but without causing them to gain excess weight. Um, so yes, very low feeding rate, 100 grams per 100 kilo body weight generally per day. If you're not sure and you're perhaps your horse is having some additional feed and you're not sure if it needs a full amount of balance, then again, just phone the you know, care line, the nutritional helpline, and um, they should be able to work it out for you. But the low feeding rate just means as well that obviously it's very limited amounts of calories, starch and sugar per daily serving. Um, so here you can see our, some of our balancers from our range. Um, so the light and lean balancer, um, slightly lower megajoules digestible energy, um, but all the rest are exactly the same um, for a 500 gram serving. So it really just comes down to, um, you know, it's not about calories and, you know, again, <laughs> the questions about, um, you know, I need a lower calorie balance or I need a less conditioning balancer. Um, they're going to vary often in terms of their vitamin E, protein, you know, some of the other um, bits and mins. But calorie content is generally always, well, it's always going to be the same or, or, you know, basically negligible. So what we put in alongside our balances often, you know, we're just looking at a double handful of chaff um, or mash, for example. Mash is a, you know, really useful, I find, um, you know, the horse thinks they're getting loads of food because it swells up. But obviously, it's predominantly water. So it's much like us having soup. You know, we feel full up, but actually it's it's 80 percent water. Um, so here you can see some of our products that we would often use as just bucket fillers and just keeping them um, a little bit happier that we've not just sprinkled a bit of balancer in their bucket um so you can see just 4.4 megajoules of digestible energy per 500 grams which um for the happy hoof and for the fiber light which um if we uh, a round bowl stub scoop um is um 500 grams essentially um and often we don't even need that much so it's um 
you can see how low it is even even with that amount and again the speedy mash is the same 500 grams of speedy mash once that's soaked up would actually look like quite a lot so um often you won't even need quite that amount so which balancer? So are balancers expensive? Um, they can appear expensive, yes. Obviously, we, you know, they're in the shop and they're X, Y, Z in comparison to what appears to be a much cheaper bag of nuts, mix or, or chaff. Um, just remember that obviously balancers, you know, a for a for a 250 kilo pony, they're generally going to last you sort of two months. Um, and because the feeding rate is much, much smaller. Um, and although, yes, you know, people may be feeding a handful of nuts, a handful of chaff, a handful of mix, that is not of nutritional benefit to your horse or pony. Um, that's not providing them with a balanced diet. Um, it's just something to cheer them up <laughs> um so if you're actually trying to feed your horse effectively and offer them a balanced diet without obviously causing weight gain um and yes in a cost effective way then balances are definitely the right option um and you can see here just some um which balancer would we choose often it's down to you know additives that they contain so our ulcer balancer for example we've got some really great benefits in terms of um gastric support as well as general digestive support um and then our supple and senior balancer for example is the one with our joint support and again the digestive support if you don't want any of those things then you've got options such as the daily balancer or perhaps the light and lean balancer and then you know the original balancer as well a really nice one um for those horse and ponies in a bit you know maybe a little bit more work and that have got um higher requirements for some of the bits and mins and it's also going to offer you the digestive support as well so it's just again if you're not sure um and you just don't quite fully understand the difference between the products then again just phone a care line or a nutritional helpline and they should be able to help you so just a little you know, note on um, workload. So um, it is really important to try and keep your horse in work if you're able to, if they're not retired and, you know, whatever the situation may be. But if they are able to work and, you you know, it really does come as the full package. So work, diet, you know, everything. Uh, you know, it's when you've got these good doers um, and so rugging and lots of other management things as well um it's it can be sort of everything all together that makes the real difference so um although you know small amounts of exercise might not um necessarily help them lose lots and lots of weight it has been um seen to help support healthy metabolism um so it, it really does you know make a difference even those small amounts but yeah it's interesting um how people define exercise and and you know, what's medium work so 48 percent here believe that packing was medium work 65 percent schooling and 70 percent lunging so yeah um it's it's very difficult to define it but basically if you can get your horse out one it helps with boredom also so if you have got a good doer and they're often you know often stood looking around waiting for food um it might just cheer them up a bit if they can go and do something different for a little while and two yeah it will help um improve their metabolism if nothing else so calories versus energy um just again a quick note on this one really um so essentially excess weight gain can have a significant effect on a horse's energy level so those good doers um if they're feeling a bit flat perhaps they're just carrying a little bit extra weight and um that's potentially why and if you focus on improving their fitness and trying to provide a varied workload um, and if necessary yes slimming them down to a healthy body condition um that might actually increase well far more likely to increase their energy than just putting more food in their bucket i always use a bit of a mcdonald's analogy of if i was going to try and run a marathon not that i ever would um but if i was um i would not eat a mcdonald's and hopefully expect it to make me feel much um more energetic um also um yeah essentially calories um yeah and energy are the same thing so you know we can't get away from the fact that if we put more mix cubes whatever it is not a balancer but mix or cubes or chaff or whatever it is in our bucket and that is going to contribute to their weight and potentially cause weight gain so unfortunately adding a scoop of competition mix um uh, you know, is not is not the answer in terms of helping them feel more energetic um, and sometimes it might just make them more silly and spooky rather than actually having any more energy um, and yeah just to highlight that calories and energy are the same 
calories is a measurement of energy um, so it's kilo calories in human food and in the UK energy in equine feed is measured in megajoules of digestible energy which is where you see the MJDE which you've probably seen throughout the presentation and this is just an example of how sources of energy can vary drastically so just from a human food point of view um, so for example our jacket potato versus our Twix bar um, as you can imagine the Twix bar um, you know much much higher in sugar and fat as well in comparison to our jacket potato which um, although they have the same you know virtually the same calorie content um, their sources of energy are very different so finally um, to rug or not to rug. Um, so you know, horses have a much greater thermo neutral zone um, than we do, and they um, can cope with between five and 25 degrees. So it's pretty brassic out there today. Um, oh, brassic, Baltic, I always say that. Um, it's Baltic out there today. Um, and yeah, so you know, my horse, I have two horses, um, and one I'd have to rug a little bit more. The other, it's been a real mental hurdle for me to get my head around that he just really doesn't need the rugs. And he was out in minus 12 in a sheet, um, and I felt horrendous, but he was warm. He was warm. Um, so yeah, it was um, enough. And yeah, he, he uh, if I didn't do that, unfortunately, I struggle. He struggles to be in, in sort of hard work now. So I haven't got that as a tool necessarily. I do what I can for him. Um, so, yeah, ha minimal rugs is one of the, you know, the tools that I have now to try and keep his weight managed. Um, so, yeah, essentially, we're trying to encourage them to burn calories, even if you're, you know, prepared to clip them and you know let them shiver if they're getting rained on and you know it they can burn a good amount of calories in that way and obviously do remember to remove their rugs regularly um one we don't want to overdo it and then suddenly they're too thin but also um if you don't take their rugs off and they're getting fatter and fatter and fatter and you don't realize um then that will be a problem when you go to take their um, rug off when it's really warm and there's loads of grass around so do take their rugs off and do monitor their rate regularly with your weigh tapes and things anyway so how can we help? Um, we do have Spiller Slimmers Club, um, which is our Facebook group. And essentially, it's a motivating, friendly club that provides practical support and camaraderie for owners of overweight horses and ponies um, to aid them on their weight loss journey. Um, it provides information and advice, including weight loss tips, details of how to body condition score and how to use a weight tape. Um, and as I've said throughout, you know, the care line as well, um, you know, picking up the phone, sending us in an email, um, you know, just ch check. Um, and if you're unsure about something, um, don't be afraid to ask. So, um, yeah, we are here to help you if you need it. Questions. That is it from me. So that's um, still on time, even with my delays. Well, <laughs> a few minutes either side. But, um, yeah. Have we got any Thanks, questions? Thanks, Gina. First question. If you have a good doer who has possible PSSM, PSSM awaiting a diagnosis, how should you rug? Oh, OK. Um, yeah, quite an individual one, really. <laughs> um, I suppose I need a few more details in terms of... Um, yeah um so are we just uh, from a muscular point of view we just don't want them getting too cold and shivering and making them sore and and that sort of thing i think rugging it's it's a difficult one obviously you'd need to have a conversation with your vet as well and i think yeah perhaps just get a little bit more detail but um they would perhaps be from a muscular health point of view would be in a better position to answer that question for you um in terms of keeping them warm but yeah good doer if you don't feel like you can under rug them because they have got something that you're worried about um then it's you know we've just got to manage it in in other ways if if possible so you know just like I said I can't ride my horse terribly hard so I have to use the tools that I can use um to manage him in the best way I can and and keep his weight down. Thank you. Um, somebody's asked a question about mash being a good alternative to chaff um, with an added balancer. I'm guessing that maybe speedy mash. Yeah, speedy mash is on the presentation. Yeah, so it's a low calorie mash. Um, and like I say, they are a really good one in terms of making them feel like they're getting a good bucket of feed, but without it being actually that high in calories. So that's good. Okay, um, next one. I have a cob with chronic progressive 
lymphedema and she is on light and lean but has to have soaked hay. Can I still soak her hay overnight in the summer? Um, I would say, have you got a Google on that one, Bella? <laughs> yeah, I also don't know what a lymphedema is. I'm just that Googling for. that. Lymphedema, equine. Is it legs or is it? Must be something about filling. Fluid in the lower legs. Okay. Um, and sorry, but that was about soaking hay in the summer overnight. and overnight. Um, again, it's all um, temperature based, really. Overnight, we still get some cooler weather, don't we? And I think we send, we tend to say that when we're talking about warmer temperatures, I think it's about 14, 15 degrees, isn't it? Um, uh, 16. 16 degrees, okay. Um, it changes. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think um, it's just being sensible. And um, if it's, you know, yeah, if it is much much warmer than that then again it's all about that kind of bacterial fermentation and and that side of things but if you can keep it cool and you've got a particularly cool barn and, and that side of things then hopefully you would still be okay overnight specifically okay, next one um new horse came to me overweight and unfit and can only manage about 20 minutes of exercise she is partially clipped no rug and soaked hay but no weight loss so far is it just a case of gradually increasing the exercise? Yeah, I think it's perseverance. And I think if mm -hmm. you weren't doing what you were doing, I always say to people, I promise you it would be worse. So, um, yeah, if you weren't managing them in the way that you are, um, then the weight gain would be, well, she would be continuing to gain weight. And yeah, absolutely, with the exercise, if you can build it up um, and building up that fitness is key. And I know I keep talking about my own horse, but honestly, I'm really struggling with him from not being, you know, the kind of horse that he is, not being able to exercise him as hard, as hard is massively affecting his weight. So um, if you can build it up, then, you know, like I said, it's the full package with these guys. Um, and it, yeah, it's hard work. I'm really sorry. <laughs> and the one thing I'm just thinking about that specific horse, you're saying um, the owner's already feeding soaked hay, but maybe consider doing some straw replacement because oh, yeah. that would be yeah. a good one that you could add in as well yeah, uh, next definitely. question is what's the best way to feed a hay replacer a hay replacer okay so mm -hmm. yeah it depends what obviously if it's you know for example our range obviously yeah happy who speedy mash um and essentially you've just got to put it in a normal dub dry bucket um trying to spread it out as i said across the day as much as possible so they're not just it's you know there and then it's gone um so yeah just multiple times a day if you can um and if you're still feeding like a balancer or something um feed your balancer and then as you walk away to leave them at night put you know pop your hay replacer in um but yeah essentially it's trying to spread it out if you can find ways to make it last a bit longer and be creative mm -hmm. then that's great i uh, also just one of my own uh, personal experiences i actually bought a um, slow feeder and there's quite a few different sort of commercially made ones now on the market. Um, my own horse got laminitis and had to be on a hay replacer for a while. And it was really, really good. Um, it's got it's like, you know, like the dog choke um, feeders. It's a similar concept. But for horses, it's much bigger, obviously, and more hard, sturdy plastic. But yeah, have a look at those as well. Um, next question. I have two thoroughbreds. One is a good doer and the other is not so good at keeping their weight on. What would you suggest on rugging them? Uh, so they're going to be completely different. So obviously mm. your poor doer is going to need a little bit more and your good doer is going to need less. Um, and yeah, just try and be strong and, and yeah, say getting in the habit of rugging them the same because one's got one and one, you know, it's, it's yeah, unfortunately, they're just going to have very different needs. Mm. Um, next question. Good doer horse is on supplementing your balancer with alpha pro fiber. Is that the right chaff? Yeah, I mean, if um, as long as you're not using a huge amount, if you're just feeding a double handful, I would say that is fine. If you're sort of getting into the kind of big round bowl stub scoop, then you are starting to contribute in terms of calories. So, we, you know, if it's about, you know, if you're wanting to get a bigger scoop of chaff in there, then you may need to consider a lower calorie option. If it's just a double handful, then I wouldn't worry too much. How quickly should I notice a difference with feeding light and lean balancer? Yeah. notice a difference in light and lean back what from feeding, feeding light and lean balancer yeah i guess it depends what you're feeding before 
Yeah. So if you um, if you're dropping down in terms of, you know, from a weight loss point of view, like we say, we don't want to have a quick weight loss because it's not healthy for them to do that anyway but if you were feeding lots of feed and you're dropping down to a balancer yeah you could see a, a, a change quite quickly so you know even sort of two to three weeks but um yeah it can be a, a longer process but yeah it does depend and like it's not a magic it's not a magic food so um you know in terms of um we have got some ingredients to try and help promote healthy metabolism, but it's not, you know, like, a, you know, we're not marketing it as like a weight loss pill or something like that. It's just, you know, light and lean balance are suitable for, um, it's actually got a really good amount of lysine in there as well. So if we have got horses and ponies on restricted forage diets. Um, it supports them in that way because lysine can be very low in the UK forage. Um, so, yeah, we just try and supplement it as an extra in there as well. Um, good doers seem to be prevalent now as opposed to years ago. Is there a reason for this? <laughs> uh, I think um, maybe, you know, potentially something how we manage our horses now. I, I don't know how yards maybe have changed over the years. Um, so, yeah, and perhaps people riding less as their you know, lives get busier and people are working, you know, busier working lives. So, um and maybe they're just, you know, good doers are more popular, the more popular kind of horse now. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's definitely a combination of things, isn't it? Mm. Livery yard setups, workload. There yeah. Is, yeah, we know there's an obesity horse crisis, isn't there? In the same way as there is people. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, OK, Pony is on box rest and he's possibly going to be on box rest for four plus months. Any tips? He is currently on a daily balancer and chaff mixed with water. Yeah, um, just it's a board and breaker thing, isn't it? So like we were saying, obviously, you can't increase his what he's eating because we, he just doesn't, he's not going to need it. So it's going to be all about that forage, spacing out that forage, you know, Bella said with our slow feeder and, you know, just um, slowing what forage we do give them, slowing him down. And perhaps, yeah, if you're really worried about his weight and you're trying to find a low calorie forage source, then, yeah, perhaps thinking about straw um, and, and that side of things as, as well. And, yes, yeah, soaking your hay because what forage we do then and we are are able to give him is low low calorie and perhaps that means we can give him an extra net um when we wouldn't normally um is there a certain age that you would change to a veteran balancer my mare is 21 but looks and moves like a youngster she's on original balancer so would it be needed is you know your horse far better than anyone else and i think if you are happy that she doesn't require that additional joint support then that's absolutely fine um and yeah no there is no defined age now as being a, a senior horse necessarily so it's yeah entirely down to you to to decide when you want to offer that um can horses hang on to their weight when they are on a strict diet he has his weighed out hay at 1.5 percent per day dry matter plus is fully clipped only lightly rugged and worked four times a week yet my out of work cob has lost weight well on that routine whilst my riding horse has stayed exactly the same way despite all winter being on this routine it's just the individual isn't it it's just mm. such hard work and some of them have and you think same as humans they've all got a different metabolic um metabolic rate so some will lose weight easier than than others so um and like i said if you weren't doing what you were doing i say believe me he would be fatter so um my my advice is to keep persevering as much as possible um and just yeah stick with it but unfortunately yeah you won't necessarily get the same rate of weight loss for every single horse and pony um next question should all horses and ponies be on some type of balancer and does this change with the seasons um ideally yeah and it obviously if they're not on any other feed and we're just trying to balance their forage essentially then ideally yes a balancer um to ensure they are getting correct amount of vitamins quality proteins you know even when the grass looks very good and if we think they're on really good forage um like i said we can't actually know without testing our forage regularly what they're getting um so you know and if they're in work just making sure they're getting you know quality protein and and everything they need for their muscle and top line as well so um um, yeah ideally we would have them on balances are good doers more prone to ulcers no we're not more prone unfortunately when we are restricting forage um it may you know if again the whole conversation around ulcers is the fact if you know the the stomach is left empty for long, long periods of time. Potentially, there can be a build-up of stomach acid, 
Um, and then if they're exercising, particularly it might splash up or it might just be that, again, every horse has a different amount of acid in its some stomach. Some are more prone to um, ulcers than others. Some good doers will never get ulcers and others do. Um, again, we don't fully understand why they occur. Is it related to just who they are as a person in terms of their temperament and their hormones and, and whatever else? Um, but yeah, what I would say is if you have got a good doer that you're restricting, then again, you know, trying to space out what you are feeding them so they're not left with you know for long long periods with nothing trying to prevent boredom you know keeping them turned out if we can and like I said you know that kind of for me that key point of if we've got a horse sitting in the stable looking at four walls I always think it's better to have them out looking about um something other to think about than they're they're hungry perfect we have made it to the end of the questions <laughs> <laughs> so unless anyone has any more questions Oh, we have two questions coming in. Okay. Uh, oh, no, do we? Or has that just jumped up? I missed a question. John. Oh. Have I missed any questions? Please type now if I have. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I breed Shetland ponies and have a mixture of good doers and not so good doers. I generally don't feed Shetlands, but obviously the ones not doing so well need feeding. Would you recommend though rugging those as well as feeding? All are out 24-7 with natural shelter. Um, potentially, yeah. And I suppose it depends on their age and things as well. Um, obviously, making sure they are able to actually eat the forage you're providing them. Obviously, age is a massive thing in terms of, you know, if they can't, I'm going to go off on a total tangent if I start talking about senior horses. But um, yeah, so yeah, if there, if there is some reason there, other than the fact that you know you're doing everything you're happy they're eating everything they should be and they're eating a good amount of um food but they're still losing weight then yeah try a rug it might just be you know obviously if then if they're getting cold um they're burning off calories keeping themselves warm and if we don't want to see them too thin then that could help another question which i think is a really good question is um why is lysine important uh, it's an essential amino acid, which means um, they can't provide it, them, well, produce it themselves, sorry, horses and ponies. So we have to provide it in the diet. Um, so, yeah, it is really important and um, we need to make sure. And, you know, from obviously we use protein for lots of different all sorts of things. Um, but again, muscle, top line, hair growth, all, everything. Um, so, yeah, it is really important they have that in their diet. And go back to the person that asked the question, do, do all horses and ponies need balancers? Pretty much yes, because lysine in the forage is really, really low. And that's obviously compounded if you're soaking or restricting your forage. They're definitely not going to be getting enough lysine, which is why you can struggle for top line with some of these good doers, remembering the difference between fat and muscle uh another question also a very good question are there any tips for getting rid of neck fat so unfortunately it's the one place in the body that i think the cells are known to actually change aren't they Bella? in terms of yes um, they've become yes. um fiberized or something yeah. like that <laughs> so once they've got a crusty neck it can be i always go almost impossible to yeah get rid of yeah. if they've had a really thickened crusty neck for me again the key when i'm body condition scoring is just trying to keep it as supple and as spongy as possible um so it's not that real thickened rock solid um yeah so um and obviously it depends on work you know we do see horses in certain types of work that have these kind of more defined thickened necks and you know they're really fit horses and it's being able to distinguish between that as as well but um um, yeah, it can be a real challenge. And I think just, as I say, keeping it nice and supple and making sure elsewhere they are, you know, really healthy body condition. So as I said, horses will distribute weight differently in the same way people do. So some will distribute it more in their neck, others more across their ribs. Um, and so, yeah, just trying to keep as, as much as possible a healthy condition score all over as well. Yeah, it's such a tough one. My own personal experience, I had a, a cob that came to me very overweight and I managed to get her really lean. Like she was a 4.5, so probably a little bit too lean, but she looked amazing still, apart from her neck. Her neck. Still had a neck. <laughs> it was the most yeah. frustrating thing. Mm. <laughs> um, right, another question. Um, can you feed fast fibre and balancer together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you are... If, depends on how much fast fibre 
correction. Um, so if you're just feeding a very small token amount, um, then that's not contributing in terms of vitamins, um, quality proteins. Um, so yes, we'd need a balance on top of that to make sure they're getting that. Assuming you've got a good doer, um, they're not, you know, they're never going to be having the full recommended amount of fast fibre to get a balanced diet. So yeah, that is that is fine. Brilliant. I think we have made it to the end of the questions again now. <laughs> 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 it's good it's good that everyone was listening and um yeah. had something to ask so yeah really good thank you very much cool okay right thank you very much thank you everybody i will stop the recording